Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 45, Pros at Cons. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live for Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more off the books after show. For those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on this audio as well as audio from our pre-show banter by backing our Patreon. As a thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to a private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show pre-production show notes, behind-the-scene blog posts, and more. This week, we are talking con prep. After the main topic, I've got a look back at the classic tile-laying game Alhambra, and I'll be talking about Twilight Imperium 4th Edition during the Tabletop Gaming Weekly. We also have something new for everyone this week. We're going to take a visit to the 13th floor. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some of the feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of in the week previous. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, last week we talked about two gaming terms, Ameritrash, Amerithrash, whatever you want to say, and Euro game or German game, however you want to word it. And most of our feedback this week comes from that. Uh, to go with that, I tossed up a poll and asked where people fall on the scale, giving them the choice of Euro or American style games. Uh, right now, we are at 55% Euro games and 45% wow. American uh, games. Interesting to see. I was thinking about it because when it first launched the poll, it really jumped up in Euros, but then slowly started to drop. And then I realized a lot of the people who followed my Twitter account specifically are role-playing players, role-playing gamers, especially D&D players. And that is rather an Ameritrash game. So I can totally see it because American games are all about the story and the experience, which is what role players seem to enjoy. No, yeah, absolutely. I do have a note from the chat that your voice is lower than mine. Oh, all righty. Okay. See about raising that up. Hopefully that's better. Yeah, we sound normal to us, but let us know if it continues. Now, looking at the comments on that, I got to say, I probably should have put a uh, what the heck does this mean option, because a lot of the comments I got were people saying, I don't know what that means. But it was a good chance for me to link them to my Ask the Bellhop article and our latest podcast. Now, speaking of comments, here are some of the specific comments we received. Keith Davies commented on the initial blog post saying, I largely agree with your definitions. One very significant difference I see between Euro and Amera games is that in Euros, randomness is typically used to determine what you have to work with, and the results are deterministic, and you base your decisions after learning what that is. While Amera games, you decide what to do, and then look to the random number generator to determine success. Well, thanks for the comment, Keith. Uh, this is the bit we we got into this quite a bit during the podcast episode last week, uh, talking about input and output randomness. And I guess I Keith's right on the money. Those are definitely two differences between Euro style games and American style games. Phil Hatfield also commented on the initial blog post and was also cool enough to repeat that comment on the social media share of that. So thanks for that, Phil. That was good to see that spread. Yeah, the lines are blurring quite a bit in the differences between the two classifications of games, Euro and American. Games like Lewis and Clark have a good theme, but also use many trappings of a Euro game with low player interaction, card hand management, resource management. Many games are heading that way. Personally, I never went with the Ameritrash moniker. I just called them both thematic games and Euro games. But even that is becoming outdated, as many games are blending aspects of both games. Well, thanks, Phil. Like everything these days, it depends is the real answer. Uh, now, Lane from Unpopular Mechanics commented on Twitter, Neither. I reckon that while this distinction used to be useful, it's incredi increasingly less valuable. 
That said, Eurogame is definitely a th still a thing, so maybe I'm just talking rubbish. Sorry, too much <laughs> coffee today. Uh, maybe you need some of the decaf I've got going here. So thanks, Lane. Uh, this is pretty much the conclusion I reached near the end of the podcast last week. It does seem like the term Euro has some merit and value nowadays. Like, I definitely still use that term. But the term Ameritrash definitely seems to be dated, especially as a derogatory term. Andreas, at the Sid Mon, tweeted, Funnily, as a German, I never thought of these things. I just buy the board games that look interesting and fun for me, and that's it. Well, thanks, Andreas. Could that be because you get to see all the great Euro games first in their natural setting? <laughs> well, thanks to everyone who took part in the Euro vs. American debate. Now, this past week, we also got a long comment on an older blog post, the Tech at the Table one. Like, that's going back to episode three or four. Phil Hatfield writes, from my experience, I would say 80% of the time, tech is a hindrance. The other 20%, it helps. I think the issue is that sometimes people cannot just switch off their desire to have their face planted firmly in foam with thumbs tapping away. The constant bling or bzzzt can get annoying after a couple hours long, or sorry, a couple hour long game. The worst is always reminding the person that it's their turn or they are missing doing something because they're paying too much attention to their phone and not enough to the game. For some people, their phone is their life. Hey, if you want to do that, if you want that to be the case, that's your choice. But I'd rather not have those people at my games. So our usual is that phones are okay for taking pictures or looking up rules and disputes or on more rare cases being used to run the game. But otherwise, the phone stays off the table and out of your hands while we are playing the game. If it's an emergency, fine, take it. But when your significant other had a terrible day because their best friend forever said something bad about them on Facebook, that does not constitute an emergency. Emergency is significant other is stranded somewhere and you need a ride. Locked out of the house. Someone in the family is in a hospital. Anything like that's an emergency. What someone said or did on Facebook is not. There's always a time to check your phone between games while it's being decided what to play next. Well, I've made a strong anti-social media movement myself in the past year or two, and honestly, I feel better for it. I would never tell anyone that they shouldn't do that, but I do tend to agree that keep it away from the table. So thank you, everyone, for the comments. And Shadzar was asking, just to jump to the chat for a second, uh, there were lots of Pathfinder fans as well. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Tonight, we've got a whole bunch of people in there. We've got Time Diversion, Anshi Games, nice. Shadzar, uh, I saw Major Kayla's around, and uh, there are some other names I see in the chat room that haven't spoken up yet whether they be bots or real people welcome to all of you we welcome bots as well we do not discriminate against our future overlords absolutely <laughs> yeah so people there are a lot of people who play D, &D so i started tweeting out this um i i maintain a list of podcasts so it's every tabletop gaming podcast i can find whatsoever and on that list uh, i shared it on twitter and people went nuts they were like oh my god this is awesome which is great so i'm glad people appreciate it but i got so many people sending me hey you missed my show you missed my show hey what about this show my favorite show is not on here and oh my god i'm starting to think that there is not a group out there that plays fifth edition DD &D that does not record it in some way and release it to the world because Wow, there are a lot of D and D actual plays, and then Shadzar mentions Pathfinder. Well, at some point, the Pathfinder online community found this list, and then the next fifty shows I got in a row were Pathfinder, and they all upset at me because after all the actual plays, they put bracket AP, and the Pathfinder like, no, in Pathfinder that means Adventure Path, and we're not playing an Adventure Path, and I don't want people to think that we're playing an Adventure Path, so you have to take AP off the end of our name. So yes, there are lots of Pathfinder fans out there, but I got to say, I, I'm I'd be shocked to find out that someone is playing D&D and not streaming it or recording it in some way, because, oh my God, it sure seems like they all are. <laughs> oh. So moving on, in the lobby, I want you guys to give us your con prep tips. 
And also, while we're going through, be sure to point out anything we forget when we get to the main topic. Now we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head on over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions is through the website. The best way for us to get questions is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Now, this is going to be one of those weeks where we don't answer anyone's specific topic, but rather offer up some general gaming advice. This week, that advice is on gaming convention prep. Now, for those of you here live, the Origins Gaming Convention, the Origins Game Fair, to be, use the proper term, one of the biggest tabletop gaming conventions in North America is just over a week away. Now, for those of you listening uh, to the podcast, as the time it comes out, if you're getting it right on Tuesday, that's in going to hit in two days. Now, added to that, Queen City Conquest is also fast approaching in July, and these are both cons that I will personally be attending. So right now, I am in the middle of con prep time. I'm getting ready to go to Origins, and actually just today, I booked our room for Queen City Conquest and started signing up for games. So this just seemed like a great time to discuss the topic of con prep on the show. Uh, we've wrapped up a few cons, but we haven't really delved into what goes on before the con for players or GMs. Very true. So just uh, a bit of history with Origins and cons in general. Um, I'm going to say I'm no expert. I'm actually pretty new to the con scene. I know many people who've been going to cons year after year, and that's not me, at least not yet. Now, way back in the day, there used to be a gaming convention here in Windsor called the Windsor Game Fest. This was held at the University of Windsor and was put on by a small university club called the Windsor Gaming Society, a club I was a member of uh, from the early age of 13. Now, this was a small local con that had hundreds of attendees and not thousands. Like, to be honest, I don't know what their attendance numbers, but I'd be surprised if they hit like even 500. Now, while it did have some industry guests, so it was big enough for that, it tended to be people just from Detroit, right? So we got our Richard Taholka, and well, the Palladium people were always here. We did get a pretty decent turnout for that con when Magic first hit the world, much to my my wallet's disappointment. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, there, there, Magic, I remember being so mad, but that's that's another story. We, we could talk <laughs> old con stories at some point, but I was so frustrated by Magic at that con, but then got hooked by the end of it. So back then, um, I tried running games. Uh, I, I ran Warhammer, I ran Paranoia, but mostly I showed up to check out the vendor room. That was the big thing because most of it was just Winter Gamers that I saw every week at the Windsor Gaming Society anyway. And I didn't really see why I needed to go to a con and pay to go to a con to be able to pay to play with people I could see every Saturday. Um, that was about it. That was the big thing for me. Now, that particular con, I got to say, didn't last long due to mismanagement. And there hasn't been one since the 1990s. Yeah, that, that con was because it was so small. Um, it was hyper local. Uh, literally, if you signed up for a game, it was a game that you could have also just played that Saturday if we were yeah. at the Windsor Game Fest normal event, uh, which played every Saturday. So the difference between the con and not the con was usually just a different room more than anything uh, yes. and, the, and the vendors. And having to pay, right? Yeah. Like, why, why would I pay to play in Don's Acrema City game when I can just show up next Saturday and play in Don's Acrema City game? Now, it wasn't until 2014 that I attended another real con. Now, technically, before that, there was some con in Ann Arbor that we stopped in at, but, like, it was one uh, Legion Hall with, like, eight tables, and all of them but one were playing miniature war games, and the other group was playing some Palladia game. Uh, we went in, checked out the four vendors, and left. So I'm not even going to count that one. Like, we didn't stay. I didn't pay to get in. We just checked it out. But in 2014, uh, both Deanna and I attended the Origins Game Fair, and for the most part, we loved it. Um, like Origins was nothing like the old Windsor Games Fest. Like this is huge. Like it, it's it's massive. Like I, I, anyone who's gone to Gen Con is probably laughing at me now, but it blew me away. Like there were just gamers everywhere, and not just at the con center. Like if you walked downtown Columbus, if you left your hotel, you went into a coffee shop. There were just gamers, and. Even just at the convention center, there was so much to see. We were there for four days, and I know there are sections of the con we completely missed. Like, I remember Sunday 
taking a wrong turn, heading down this one hallway and opening up a, a, a hallway doors to see like 10,000 gamers. And it ended up that room had been there the whole weekend. And it's where all the CCGs and card games were being played, like thousands of gamers that I missed for four days. Didn't even know they were there. That was crazy. Now, the biggest thing that hit me about walking into Origins and seeing all these gamers is that it felt like home. I was surrounded by people, which kind of gets to me sometimes, really gets to Deanna. I'm, I'm better with people than she are. I, I don't mind crowds. But like these weren't just people. They were gamers. Everyone there had something in common with me. We all loved games enough to spend a small fortune to go to this place to play together. And that is one concern with cons. While they can be done cheaply with enough planning between travel and accommodations, even before you get onto the con floor, it's an investment. So planning is key or you could be wasting some of that hard earned money. Very, very true. Now, based on how good a time we had in 2014, we knew we had to come back. But as Sean just mentioned, they're not cheap. And as I mentioned, they, it costs a lot to go to, especially Origins. The hotels near there, the convention center are not cheap at all. Uh, it just it wasn't in the budget for 2015, but we did manage to save up over the year to be able to make it back in 2016. And that was an even better experience. And what was better about that is I spent a lot more time networking and socializing. And that's when I met people we talk about on the show all the time, the misdirected Mark, Gnome Stew, and Coded Design people from Buffalo. And that was when Origins blossomed for me. Well, and if it hadn't been for the uh, gem folks, this podcast wouldn't even exist. Yeah, credit to them. So then in 2017, Deanna and I branched out and hit two cons. Uh, early in the year, we hit Breakout Con in Toronto. Now, listeners and viewers of the show have heard us go on about Breakout enough. Uh, we rave about it. It's awesome. It's still one of the most diverse, welcoming, and social cons I've attended. And that's not giving any credit to the awesome gaming and panels to be had. Yeah, it is uh, so awesome that this year the whole Bellhop crew made it out and uh, continue to spread the word. Now, it was at Breakout that Sean Gilgore convinced me I had to attend another con called Queen City Conquest. Basically, he was like, if you're willing to drive to Toronto, you should be willing to drive to Buffalo. It's about the same distance, which true enough, it is. Uh, this is a local con for all those gem people we just mentioned. So this time, all three of us made it out. Uh, Sean, Deanna, and I attended, and it was also a great experience. Now, this is a smaller con. Like, this was closer to the Windsor Game Fest than anything like an Origins or a PAX. This, this was small enough that, uh, sorry, it was big enough that there was still lots to do and people to meet, but it wasn't overwhelming and huge. Yeah, it was definitely an intimate personal experience for a con. Now, sadly, due to a medical emergency with my parents that pretty much changed our lives, we paid for and didn't attend Origins 2017. Now, Deanna and I did make it back last year to Origins, and at this point, the con had kind of changed for us. At this point, we had con friends. Now, these are people we met previous years and at other cons that we get to meet up with and hang out again at cons. So 2018 Origins was much more of a social con for me. Now, while I had a great time gaming and getting to try new stuff, the con shifted to be more about the people. And the same goes for Breakout 2019, which we talked about on previous episodes. Because for me now, a game convention is just as much about the games I play as the people I play them with. And the downtime spent with friends is just as valuable to me than the time as the time walking the vendor hall and playing games. So now that you have a bit of background on my con resume, yes, I know maybe we shouldn't say pros at cons when we've only been through a handful of cons, but we did do a lot of research, listen to a lot of tips, and we know lots of people that go to cons. So let's get on to some actual con prep tips. So one of the first is be sure to actually register for the con early and sign up. Don't just show up to the con expecting to get in. Uh, this is a bit of a warning from a friend of ours who tends to forget to actually sign up to cons and then shows up and is just like, oh, wait, I never actually did that, did I? Um, for one, con solo. It, it happens. It happened at Gen Con even. Cons do slow. None of the ones I've gone to have sold out yet. So it is possible you could travel all the way to Columbus, Ohio, show up to the door and not get into the con at all. 
But even more so, if you pre-register, there's always a pre-registration line and then a registration line. And if you've seen any of those registration lines, you don't want to wait in those lines at all. Absolutely. Uh, the the lines, even uh, even at QCC, uh, sorry, not QCC, at Breakout this year, yeah. uh, that first day line right for registration was pretty significant. And we walked by it all and smiled and nodded to them and, and then went and met with all our friends. Yes. Uh, yeah. But the other thing about signing up early is support your GMs. Now, these GMs have planned out their games and put the schedule out. Uh, and if you sign up for them, that knows that, you know, what, they, what they're doing. And they don't have to worry that they might end up canceling the game and not mm -hmm. being able to do something that they had scheduled and planned. So supporting your GMs by signing up for their games makes a big difference to them. Yeah, then uh, Deanna mentioned something good too. Often you will save money by pre-registering. Almost every con has early bird rates. Definitely worth watching for uh, Queen City Conquest. We've already missed it, but they have a sale once a year and they have a sale before the con and try to sign up then. Yeah. So besides just signing up for the con, getting to what Sean's saying, you also want to sign up for individual events. Now, every con I've been through does this different. So, and, and I'm sure there's cons I haven't been through that do it different. Like some you have to pay for events. Sometimes you don't have to pay some things have tokens like origins you can buy generic tokens that cost two bucks each even the panels at origins you have to pay to attend so that's something research that ahead of time figure that out before you get there so you're not surprised because i admit the first time i tried to go to a panel at origins and they asked me for a token i was like why well, i gotta pay to sit in on a panel i'm like okay whereas my previous experience experience of panels was at breakout con and breakout con you pay to get in the door and that's it like any game you sign up for, you could play games all night, all literally all night, overnight, and not pay any more than your entry fee. So that's something worth re researching. But do actually sign up, right? Uh, games fill up. But the other half of it, as Sean said, is it shows support for the people early. Uh, I'm on a bunch of different, like I listen to podcasts and I'm on Slack channels and stuff. And you see people bemoaning the fact they're like, oh my God, it's a week before Origins and no one signed up for my game. And they get stressed out. So by signing up early, it does. It helps the DM out and it lets them know how many people are going to be there. So the next thing is uh, looking at getting to that con and what you're going to, how you're going to do there, how you're going to be there, how you're going to live there and get there. Um, you know, an important portion is the, the money you spend to get there and stay there, mm -hmm. uh, not the con itself. The con itself is probably going to be part of the cheapest part uh, yes. of the, of the entire event. Yeah, surprisingly. And the other thing is don't trust con rates. Like I, I, I don't get this myself, but every con I go to is like, oh, we have con rates at the hotel and for parking every single time, every con we have gone to Deanna has been able to find a better deal. Like without fail, every time we found a better deal. Breakout was ridiculous how much cheaper we ended up paying for a hotel at a five-star hotel than would have been to stay on site for just a short walk. So do your research. Um, make, shop around. Deanna's the, the master of this. Um, we could probably have her start um, start uh, doing consultation for con finding people hotels and taking a 10% cut. And you'd still be saving money. It's crazy. Um, so definitely shop around. Expedia is your friend. I'll give you that small tip. Um, the problem with Expedia is it's non-refundable. So earlier I mentioned we paid to go to Origins and didn't go one year. Well, that's because of Expedia. We were able to refund our tickets to Origins. They gave me all my generics back and all that. But the hotel we had to pay for even though we didn't go. So that is something to watch for. Yeah. Now, one of the things you want to think about, um, and again, this depends on your budget, but if you can stay at the con hotel, there are actually bonuses to that. Uh, the ability to, you know, have a good time with people at the con r as late as possible and then, you know, stumble into a into a elevator and back up to your room without having to worry about in an unfamiliar city walking back to an unfamiliar place mm -hmm. and whatever may happen within that city. Uh, the safety and security of, of sort of conning in that same place is definitely a benefit, but it's one you have to weigh with the cost, which can be significant. Also a big deal if you're shopping. If you are going to buy a lot of games or you expect to take a lot of or you're even bringing your own games to play, you've got to carry those games, right? So staying on site can be a huge advantage to that. So you don't have to travel as far. Yeah. 
Now, another tip is actually call hotels. Don't just check online. Uh, many hotels will say they're booked, but actually have rooms available. And when you do call, if you're staying four or five nights, see if they have a multiple night discount. No, absolutely. Uh, and then the other option that uh, I don't think either of us are especially familiar with, but Airbnb is there. Uh, and depending on where that con is located, there may be Airbnb locations around and you may be able to get some good deals there. I know Origins is a little different because of uh, it's uh, lining up with Pride Weekend. You're probably mm -hmm. not going to get a deal no matter what you do, because yes. everyone is there for all the reasons. But uh, other cons that uh, don't have such other conflicts with other events, you may be uh, luckier and be able to score yourself some uh, good rates with Airbnb. And also, don't be afraid to stay a little further out, right? Like, um, especially if you're in good enough shape to do some walking, staying two blocks away can save you hundreds of dollars. Staying one kilometer away, sorry, I don't know what that is in miles, 2.5 miles, or is it the other way around? 0.6 miles. 0.6 miles, so stay, whatever. Stay, staying a couple kilometers, a couple miles away, and taking the 10-minute walk every morning will again save you money. But even... More so, you might stay 15, 20 minutes away and take an Uber in or check public transit in the area. Or what I'm seeing more and more often is people hooking up with other con goers and carpooling in. So every morning, Bob drives the whole gem team from wherever they're staying, however far away, into the con center, parks at the con, and then drives them all home at a certain time at night. Now, of course, that's where you lose out on any of those late night parties and anything else you might want to do at night. And if your ride wants to leave, you may be stuck. But if it saves you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, it might be worth it. Absolutely. And depending on where you are, there are some really some great options. Uh, actually, for work once, I stayed in Baltimore, uh, but was working in a completely different city because there was transit that took me from city to city. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's totally an option available to you. Yeah, the other tip uh, Deanna's just pointing out, make sure you book early, not just for the convention, but also for the stays, because like Origins in particular, there's Pride is the exact same weekend as Origins every year. It's also Father's Day weekend. There's other events going on. There's a German festival that's in the German town that's just north of the convention center. Places fill up quick, like ridiculously quick. But again, don't trust it when the con says, oh, our con hotel's full. Call, ch check online. A lot of times when they're saying their con hotel is full, uh, when you book an event, you'll get a section of that hotel that works under the con price. Uh, and when that's sold out, you can't get anything else at that con price. But that doesn't mean they, the hotel is booked. That just yeah. means that they're out of bookings for that con section. Mm -hmm. Another big one that's popular, especially with uh, some of the podcasts I follow, is sharing rooms. So if you are worried about the price, consider doing getting the double beds and sitting four people in the room and having someone sleep on the floor. Just make sure you okay it with the hotel. Don't book a room for two occupancy and then have six people stay in the room. That's a good way to get booted. Absolutely. They will, they will pay attention to hordes of people wandering up after one person gets two keys. Yes. Uh, <laughs> or, or question you if, if one person gets four keys. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, so the next thing you got to worry about, once you've once you figured out where you're staying and you figured out how you're getting there, uh, whether you, you know, whether you're driving or driving with friends or taking an Uber from somewhere else, mm. the next thing you got to worry about is food, because yes. we all need to eat, even if sometimes we forget because we're having too much fun playing <laughs> games. Eating is important. Yes, it is. Uh, there, there's a few things. So. One of the things I like to eat well when, when I travel, I like to eat well all the time, to be honest. But when I travel, I'm always looking for, for well-reviewed, good restaurants, stuff, especially unique things I can't get here in Windsor. Uh, like I tend to avoid eating pizza when on trips because Windsor has the best pizza in the world. So why would I eat pizza when I'm far away? And when I did eat pizza in Columbus, Ohio, I shared that picture just so everyone here could see just how bad it was. Um, but to be honest, I, I like my, my big secret is like TripAdvisor and Zomato, right? I just Google it, right? Like I'm like best breakfast breakfast in Columbus in within five kilometers of the convention center. Uh, the other thing too, is check with other con goers. Like there are at least five threads going right now on Facebook, where he did origins, um, specifically origins. Like the, there's a million places to eat. The main thing you probably want to avoid is I almost never recommend eating on site. Every time I've done this, it doesn't matter what con it is. I've been disappointed. Uh, usually it's not the best food and it's always overpriced. 
And the same thing with your hotel. Like it's often worth taking a short walk to find better food. Like even though your hotel may have a breakfast place and the you know a Franz on the first floor, you're probably better off taking a couple steps out the door and finding an expectations just down the street. Now, Origins is the opposite. Origins, like, well, not the opposite. Don't eat on site. The, the food court in the convention center is tolerable. It's probably about as good as I would give it. If you really only have 10 minutes between games, you could probably run down and grab Subway. But the North Market is less than a block away. It's it's half a block. It's across the street, across a parking lot. Is this amazing food market with over 20 different vendors selling hot food. Where you just start walking north up the main street, and you're going to find restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. It's in the foodie district for origins so origins is the place to eat yeah no, like, I, I go to origins for food <laughs> as much as i do for gaming and people just not the pizza but uh, yes. no i remember you're always paying for convenience so if it's convenient to your hotel or convenient to your uh gaming con you're paying for that and that doesn't mean you're getting quality that just means you're getting something right there now the other option uh that is becoming more and more realistic and it, it was used quite a bit at uh, qcc is uh, options like Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes or whatever your local food delivery service is. A lot of, yeah, dial a meal, a lot of options now yeah. exist where you can order food. And if you do have tight turnarounds in your games, if you're playing a lot of back to back games, this is a great option as long as you can get delivery to wherever you are, uh, because it means you can have a real meal. Uh, and yes, you're paying a bit of a premium, but you're going to get a good meal and it's going to come right to you without you having to wander around the city. So just jumping to a couple things in our chat, uh, Grubhub, I guess, has replaced Skip the Dishes in a couple places. Um, food trucks at Gen Con is a legendary thing. People talk about them all the time. But I don't know if the food's good. All I know is the lineups get terrible and there are food trucks. Uh, from what I hear, there isn't a lot to eat besides that. Uh, Shadzar is mentioning the grocery store. Well, that's part of the thing with Origins in the North Market. It is a full farmer's market. So that brings us to the next thing. You don't have to eat out, which is what I was going to get to next anyway. One of the biggest things nowadays for me is these, not necessarily specifically this brand, but granola bars, protein bars, portable snack food. I now bring to every con. I fill up my bundle of my bag of holding with them. Uh, beef jerky, uh, Deanna mentions, is something she also brings, as well as bottled water to have something to drink. This is great if you don't have time between games, right? Plus, most of the games I played, I noticed this at Breakout, people are perfectly cool that you're snacking during the game. So even if you have a game scheduled another game, you can sit there and snack on your kind bar or whatever brand of granola bar you actually like eat that while you're finishing up one game so you're not starving by the next now some cons even have snack food provided in different rooms uh sometimes this is for guests and vips but i've also seen it in the quiet rooms where they'll have like apples and fruit for people to have water is getting more common more cons i go to origins even does this there are big jugs of water everywhere just bring a refillable water bottle even if it's just a twist top and that's usually the one thing i buy on site is i go to some snack stand at the convention center and buy a bottle of water to drink and then just keep filling up all weekend but bring your own right bring your own food keep it in your thing and, and the other thing is if you really want to be a pro lawful good good alignment earn some xp gamer bring extras so when you're sitting at that table with the other gamer and they're like, oh, my God, I got a game in 10 minutes and I'm starving, hand it off. You want some bonus life, bonus life, bonus points? Bringing extra is great. Now, Deanna has a tip for this one. Last time we went to Orlando, we did this, but this is a good con tip, is you can buy in bulk off Amazon and get it to ship to the hotel room. So you could buy a full box of Kind Bars, or if you're a Gatorade person, buy a six-pack of Gatorade and get it delivered to your hotel so it's ready when you get there. For those of you coming from another country like ours, this is fantastic, because then I don't have to bring this stuff over the border. Absolutely. Uh, other options, other great options, you know, if you're a photographer, uh, if you're going to the States, rent a lens. You don't have to bring all your camera gear. You bring, you know, bring your bring your favorite body, and you can rent lenses and uh uh, flashes and things and have them shipped right to your hotel room uh, ready for you to go when you get there at reason quite reasonable prices <laughs> oh i think i just broke d <laughs> what where oh. lensrentals.com <laughs> lensrentals.com there you go you're um, gonna yep. have to look into that one absolutely so this is something too nowadays that it wouldn't have been a con suggestion i would have made 
any a few years ago, but social media is just keeps growing, right? It keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I know we tell people, put the tech down when you're at the con, but between games and that, definitely look online because every con is going to have like a Facebook page and they're going to be on social media. They're going to have Twitter accounts. And I have found social media fantastic for finding the off the book stuff. And this is the networking, right? You're going to find out about a podcast get together at this local pub a block away. You're going to find out that Queen Games is going to do a giveaway at six o'clock. You're going to find all this stuff. Like I, I do social media a lot, right? It's part of what I do as a tabletop bellhop. But at cons, I don't stop. I keep checking this stuff up. I have gotten invited to too many different things. Same thing if you're done a game, you just go into your local group and be like, hey, anyone want to do some food? I'm about to find dinner. And then someone else will be like, hey, we got reservations at Barley's. Why don't you come join us, right? It's the kind of thing that happens, whether that's Twitter or whatever. Uh, Deanna points out a good one. Watch for hashtags on Twitter. Um, Discord channels. The other thing you can do is if you know a group of gamers who are going, set up a group for that group, like a, a Facebook group for that group or a Discord channel or a Slack channel or whatever your social media of choices. Instagram doesn't really work too great for this one. But that is what we do. Like we're talking about the gem team. The gem team has a private Slack channel. That private Slack channel has an Origins 2019 room and it has a Breakout Con room and it has a Queen City Conquest room. And all of us that know each other now use that to go, hey, anyone at base camp i need this or hey we're looking for dinner anyone want to meet up or hey anyone got a game at 8 p.m because i'm free and so on it's a great way to do the stuff that's not on the schedule all the off the book stuff yeah absolutely uh and that's another big thing once you've once you've uh, got all your stuff booked don't overbook yeah make sure you leave yourself some time some room for pickup games but also to connect with friends make new friends meet people uh, you know, interact with people. Again, we wouldn't have this podcast if it wasn't for friends made and discussions had after between, you know, the people you've met at Origins and the discussions that we mm-hmm. had after Breakout Con the first time uh, that led to this podcast forming. Uh, yeah. So make sure you've got time. Well, I don't yeah, know about sleeping plus- time. You can sleep after the con, but the rest <laughs> no, there's that rule. <laughs> sleeping, sleeping is important. Um, I, I forget the term, whatever the four two one rule, get four hours of sleep, eat two meals a day and take one shower a day or something. I forget the terms. I wasn't going to mention those. I think everyone knows those con ones. But time for yourself. Uh, self-care is important. Most cons nowadays are nice and modern and woke and have a quiet room you can go to. And if you can't leave, go to a coffee shop. Go for a walk. Get out of the con for a bit. You don't have to be there all the time. And I see Major Kale in the chat saying, must play all the games. And I really think that's harmful. I don't think it's a good idea. There are too many people that over the book themselves at cons and burn themselves out. It's not fun for the people you're playing with. And it's not fun for you when you're tired, exhausted, and just gaming to game. You're no longer having fun. The point of going to a game con is to meet people and play games with them and have fun playing games together. Don't forget that that's your goal. Yeah, and she games talks about getting over people and and I'm very much the same way. Um, Unless I am very familiar with people, I don't, you know, I don't deal well with strangers and crowds at all. Um, so I know QCC for me was a lot of, you know, I would go and I'd play a game, playing a game with you with some strangers and then go hide with D and play some board games, <laughs> yeah. uh, because that, that was comfortable and fine. And, uh, but now that I know more people and we, and you know, the next time I, I do get to go back to QCC, it's going to be a different experience because I know more of the gem people and we met yeah. more of them at breakout. Uh, and so that changes, but you know, going to these cons can definitely be overwhelming for some people. Uh, and it's always important to make sure that you have that decompression time away from whatever it is that may, oh, may oh. concern you. Sean just froze. Oh, did I freeze? No, not on my side. Sean just froze. Just for you, not for me. Reconnecting. Oops. You froze. Hello. Apparently Mo has got some issues on his Skype side. No. Uh, I see you now. All right. Well, apparently Mo, has, weird. Mo has had some issues with Skype. Well, uh, it was all fine on this side, so it's just you. We're all good. All right. That was weird. We good now? Well, barely. All right. That was odd. A glitch in the, uh, a glitch in the web. It, someone changed something in the media. Yes, there we go. Uh, so, Shadzar already brought this up. A lot of cons now are talking about 
uh, you know, mandatory social media stuff, whereas you need to have an app, uh, you need to have your ticket on your phone, you need to have some form of electronics with you, or you're not going to get the full experience. And what that means is your battery is going to die. Yeah. So. Yeah, so you want one of these just bought this yesterday you want some type of portable charging backup battery pack you want to remember your charging cables and bring your cubes that's what i call them i don't know if that's the proper term. these things that you plug into the wall <laughs> bring your cubes make sure you can charge your tech even if it's not necessarily you need to have the tech for the con, everyone's going to want your phones. You want people, you want to be able to be reached in case of an emergency. You want to be able to Google something. You want to look up rule questions in the middle of the game. You can listen to our tech on the table episode for all the good reasons. You actually do want your tech charged. Plus, most people can't live without it. And trust me, you're going to go insane if you forgot your charging cable. Or more likely, you're going to find the nearest Best Buy and buy a new one. Yeah, and now Shadzar points out wall sockets. To me, I won't That's... generally assume I'll ever find a wall socket. If I do, bonus, awesome if you can. Uh, but I will always carry a battery pack because nowadays it's just not sure that you're going to find a wall socket. Or if you do, that seven other people aren't lined up waiting to use that same yes. one wall socket. Yeah, totally. Um, BrakoCon, oh, sorry, Queen City Conquest, which it was the venue. It wasn't the con that put this out. Had this awesome charging center where you literally, but you had to leave your phone there, but like you put in a, your secret code and then it opened a door and it had every possible plug and you plugged in your thing and closed the door. You had to come back and give your code in to get it back. I'd never seen that before. Uh, but QCC, other than that, was terrible for plugs. I couldn't find plugs anywhere. Origins, I'm starting to know the spots, but when you're on the dealer vendor floor, no way. You are not going to be able to plug in anywhere on the demo floor, on the tournament floor, in the vendor hall whatsoever. Yeah. Out in the hallway, there's some spots, but I'm not telling you where they are because I might need them. It's one of those places where you want to go with those little wall, the little uh, wall plug stickers that you still throw up and confuse people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are great for those are great for airports. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so the next thing, you've got all this stuff now. You've got your games. You've got the stuff you picked up at the vendor tables. You need to carry it. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked about this a little bit. We've seen uh, we've seen Mo's bag of holding. But I uh, want a big, big shout out to uh, DNA Phil over on Twitter here, who is the bag master. Uh, the, the, and, and may, in fact, at some point, get himself a uh, podcast specifically for bag recommendations. Uh, but he has said, hit him up at QCC. He will be walking the floor and you can ask him about bag suggestions for your needs. Yeah, that's at DNA Phil on Twitter. If you have a question about the best way to carry anything, hit up Phil. He's your man. Absolutely. But whatever you choose, however you choose it, you need something to carry your stuff, your cables, your charging cubes, yeah. your purchases, uh, board games if you're bringing them, the dice for the games you're going to be playing in, pencils, paper, character sheets. You're going to have stuff and you need a way to carry it. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can go on here. Uh, personally, luggage on wheels is good. One of the things to think about, though, if you are going to a con that you may not think about just traveling anywhere is how much room does your bag take up? This is a serious concern in crowded vendor halls. You don't want to be that person with the giant bag who every time they turn is banging into people or knocking over product or taking up an entire hall do not over size your bag you bring a big bag to the hotel room but have something smaller portable for moving around yeah backpacks are a bad thing like i know we talk about board game backpacks and there are some fantastic backpacks out there and they're comfortable and they're supportive for your back and they allow you to ha carry heavy loads but they also are a pain in the butt in a crowded hall like yeah. there are a few things worse than a backpack because you will hit people with it and you will be apologizing for hours on end. So one of the things I'm just going to mention this one to me, remind everyone, because this one can be a serious issue getting back to health is remember to pack your meds and some way to carry them while you are on the con floor. And remember your meds when you are scheduling your games. If you have something you have to take every day at noon, when you go on con, that doesn't, that's not your cheat weekend. Make sure you take your meds at noon. It's definitely something to uh, keep track of and remember. I admit I'm terrible for 
this. I forget mine all the time. I don't forget to bring them, but I forget that, yeah, I'm supposed to take something with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And well, one of my cons, I'm really bad for not eating lunch. So again, go with the snack bars. You've got your snack bar, you've got your hand of pills, and you got your bottled water. Doesn't matter if you're middle of the game. No one's going to get upset if you're like, hey, can you excuse me for a minute? I got to take my pills. Yep. So remember, take your time to book things in advance plan yeah. in advance that's one of the big keys about planning for cons is making sure that you do plan for the con in advance uh running out the door on your way to the car or the or the airport to get to the con is not the time to think about this stuff um and for some things like your hotel you may be thinking a year in advance or you know yeah. six months in advance so at planning in advance and then as you get closer you know if you're four weeks out, start thinking about making sure you have. Do you have a battery pack you'll be able to bring with you? Do you have all the cables you're going to need for when you go? Mm -hmm. Have you got dice? If, are you gonna, if you're going to be playing in a fake game, do you have dice? Or are you planning to buy them there on site? Uh, Don't I know, count on that. I made that mistake yeah. at BreakoCon Mo, one year. Mo likes to uh, have brand new dice for every, every game he goes to, but uh, they didn't have any at that time. So, you know, figure out whether, what vendors are going to be there. Uh, one of the things I saw recently, Phil, um, was talking about going, uh, his plans to go to Origins and, uh, was look, was shouting out to vendors to find out he was looking for a specific set of dice. And rather than Kickstartering, he called out to them on Twitter to find out if he was able to pick it up on site. So may reach out to, uh, reach out to people if you want to in advance. So one note on that, you mentioned vendors and this, I think it's worth mentioning uh cons can be expensive in more than one way game vendors at cons it goes both ways don't trust that they're going to be cheap or affordable i've their con markup is a thing you may go to a con and you're going to pay more than you would pay at your local game store uh like sean said convenience is everything right you are paying for the convenience of getting that game now so you can play it uh price around shop around um i to try to save money on games now you also get the opposite origins in particular there are a few booths on the shop floor cool stuff inc has a booth for example but there's this one that i don't know the name of the store but every year they build a castle out of board games they like give away games for like five dollars at times there and another company i think it's troll and toad has a huge ding and dent sent section so you may actually be able to save money on games but don't assume you're getting a good deal just because of vendors at a con it's still worth shopping around Absolutely. And do pay attention to uh, the end of con possibilities. Yes. Uh, a lot of a lot of times it costs a lot of money to bring product to cons and, and get it in and out. Uh, and there's a whole I can go into I can go for <laughs> hours on drayage costs. But uh, a lot of times people are really incentivized to sell their product and not get Before it back out of the con because that's another cost mm -hmm. for them. Once they've got it there, they've paid to get it there. They may have to pay to get it out again. And if they don't have to do that, they're going to be happy. Think Geek was great. I got so many Think Geek shirts because they did not want to have to ship them back to their home office from various uh, convention floors. Uh, so you could get $20 shirts for $10 or less. Wow. Really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's sun the Sunday sale is, is a big deal at con. Sundays are always slower. And to be honest, if you're shopping, you just go to the last day. Like if that's what you actually carry the most, care about the most, show up on the last day of the con only. Um, so one of the things Sean said, make sure you schedule. Just again, don't over schedule. Like in that schedule should be free time. That should be scheduled. You don't want to be booked for everything because there are a ridiculous number of things like pickup games, con games. Um, sorry, off the books, games, things that you don't know you want to do until you're there. So I hate booking every hour. I usually book two to three things a day. One in the early morning, well, not early morning, but one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And the rest of the con I leave open so I can then fit stuff in and do other things. So let's take a trip back to the lobby and we'll see what our fine folk in our chat room think we missed. Uh, I'd like to apologize to Major Kayla, seeing as how I just dissed auctions and she's running the one at QCC. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, auctions are a thing. Like yep. I, I have no problem. I personally prefer. I like the auction format of Breakout. I thought that was really cool. Hmm. The Origins auction I hear is insane every year, but you have to pay to go to the auction, which is something I personally don't want to do. Right. 
Now, I mean, we did, there was a small concern about how the QCC auction happened last year, and I'm sure they are addressing that. So uh, we look forward uh, to a, a better event this year, and uh, hopefully Major Kayla will uh, see to that. Now, the first suggestion I saw, and I've heard this many times, is bring extra pairs of socks and change partway through the day. This is actually a solid thing. You have no idea why. I don't know why. Like, it's, it's got to be a mental thing or something. But changing your socks at, like, you know, three in the afternoon in the middle of the day really refreshes you in an odd way. I don't know. That's, that's a tip I actually know from working overtime, working 12-hour shifts. Like, keep a pair of socks in your drawer at work. For some reason, that's, that's also a con thing. No, and, and do think about comfortable shoes. One thing people yes. don't often think about is these conventions are most often at, well, surprise, surprise, Convention centers. Yeah. Convention centers are con poured concrete floors. They are unforgiving. So even if there is carpet in some areas, it's probably laid straight over concrete and with little mm -hmm. or no padding underneath. And that is a wear and tear with every step. So wear comfortable shoes. Insoles are highly recommended just to absorb some of the shock because every step you're taking is down onto solid concrete. All right. Did we see anything else? Uh, pencils, in the chat? pencils, lots of pencils. Bring golf yes. pencils. Bring pens. Bring writing instruments. Writing instruments. Uh, uh, Sharpie. I would recommend a Sharpie. A lot of times, uh, we actually had to customize our badges at uh, Breakout Con yes. this year. So if you've got a Sharpie there, that will always help. Uh, sometimes you'll need to do uh, names and names in front of you at, at the table at uh, games. Little uh, three by five index cards so that everyone knows who you are. People may be passing out pens. Sharpies just more readable across a table. So yes, pencils, pens, and Sharpies. And I personally recommend strongly index cards. Bring index cards. You never know what they can be useful for, whether that's just a table tent in front of you so everyone knows your name, or it's writing down notes in an RPG or passing notes to the GM, or whether it's keeping track of your final score in a board game so you can log it on Board Game Geek later. I'd rather carry these than carry a whole notebook that takes up a lot of room. These don't take up a lot of room. Huge fan of those. I've been using those more at your cards. Um, Personally, another thing I'm a no I want to bring I'm is no if you are any part of industry professional or trying to get your name out there, don't forget your business cards. Uh, important for myself, obviously, going to a con. But if you do any type of social media, if you want more people to follow your Twitter account, whether you do a podcast or you're a business, it doesn't hurt. Have a business card with your name or number on it. Also, really good if you want to hook up with people after the con. If you find someone you have a great time gaming with and you want to set up a D20 game using Roll, whatever it's, Roll20 game online later, you don't have to write down name and number. It's here you go. Hit me up up to the thing. Here's my Skype address, right? Uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of spiral bound notebooks, but that's just me. I, uh, I, I used to get them for free from work. So I'd have, you know, various 200 page uh, spiral bound mm -hmm. notebooks lying around and they're fantastic and they hold pens in the, in the spirals nicely. Uh, so those yeah, are nice my go to spiral too, as they lay flat, which yeah. is a nice touch. So I don't know, is there anything in the chat has any questions on this? We obviously didn't cover everything, right? Weird. I was trying to hit the stuff that you don't hear all the time. Like take a bath. Come on. Eating food, yeah, everyone talks about that. We were trying to we were trying to go to this a different angle. I didn't want to go specifically into like DM prep, but if you're gonna run a game, prep your game. If you're gonna teach board games, learn the board game, make sure you know how to play. Play a bunch of times. Like that that's kind of generic. And stuff I to and me. I believe next week's episode of Misdirected Mark may be focusing on con prep for RPGs. So there you go. Check that out. That will be on uh, the uh, live on the 11th, Tuesday, the 11th. There you go. Perfect time. Uh, all right. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. If you got questions for us, be sure to head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just email us a question to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. 
Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email, recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, videos, unboxings, whatever we create, it's in there. There's links, easy to find, everything in one place. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe on the sidebar. Now, we've already mentioned it, but Origins hits next week or in two days if you're listening to this on the podcast. I'll be there. If you see me, please feel free to say hi and introduce yourself. Also, please, please do not be offended if I forget your name. I am terrible with names and faces, and I apologize in advance for that. You are going to see me if you walk up, try to stare down at your badge. So another tip if you're at a con, make sure your badge is facing out so people can read it. And when you go to after con events, don't take your badge off. Please leave it on so there's a chance I may know who you are and not be like, uh, I know I met you before. Um, Hi, dude. So there is one other thing that's going to be impacted by Origins, and that's our live show. So what we're going to do is release one of our bonus episodes we recorded some time ago now. Yeah, we're going to be trying out the premiere function here on Twitch. So it's something we haven't done before. Uh, we're going to release the tabletop bellhop break uh, break room number one, geeking out about the geek. So tune in at the regular time of 830 Eastern at the regular place, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop to heal the bellhop. And I talk about one of the best tabletop gaming resources out there for game geek. Now, Queen City Conquest is hitting much earlier this year. This year will be July 12th to 15th and will be held at a new venue, Damon College. Unfortunately, due to the state change, I'm unable to attend. But Deanna and I will be there. I would like to thank Queen City Conquest and specifically Chris Nizak for extending an invitation to the entire Bellhop team to attend QCC as official guests. Uh, this is actually the first time we've officially been invited as guests to a cons and I'm honestly quite honored. Um, now, right now, my focus is Origins. It's next week, but I'm sure we'll be talking about QCC here more in the coming weeks. Last Friday, Deanna finally returned home and was feeling well enough to play a game. The problem is that Tori got stuck at work. So for our Gloomhaven game, we only had three players. Now, thankfully, Tori was generous enough to give us the go-ahead to play the campaign without him. Like, we were replaying a scenario for the second time, so it's not like he was going to miss out on anything. Maybe the ending of it. And we didn't reveal anything new. So thank you very much, Tori, for letting us game, even though you weren't there. And I'm sorry you got stuck in Chatham so late. Though, I think we really could have used your help. Yeah, it was an interesting experience, be certain. And technically, he did miss something. He missed the reading of the book oh, that that's right. was that's triggered... True by what he did five weeks ago and we just sort of never never got to that yeah i totally <laughs> forgot about that in the recap we totally forgot that there's the book of records that as soon as a character retires you're supposed to open the book of records and read from it we we completely missed that so going back to the stream now first off i gotta apologize for the trolls that were in the chat room um oddly we've never had that problem before and thankfully tonight doesn't seem to be a problem i thought it might be so i do want to thank you sean for being on top of it that was a bit of a mess yeah it was my first real experience having to moderate uh and and it was a lucky sort of date too because normally i'm not actually sitting at the computer uh during a lot of the uh especially the intro the, the beginning uh time of that uh but i happened to be at the time and was able to learn how to moderate really quickly <laughs> Uh, and luckily of all, I was able to clean that part up. So the YouTube video is free of all of the, uh, the trolling yeah, the, the, uh, inter the interactions. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. I noticed when you deleted the comments, they never showed up on the chat. Like if you watched it again on Twitch, but if you booted the person, it didn't delete their previous stuff. Oh, interesting. But if you literally deleted the individual comments, they were gone. Because I went and watched through it to see if it was still there because Deanna didn't, I, I showed her some of what had happened. Right. And it wasn't there, which was good. So I was good to see that isn't there, but I think we're not, probably not going to highlight that particular video. Yeah, and they were all reported as well, which is I, something I need to, next time I need to block them and then go back and take more time reporting them later yeah. because I think the better better reporting may do something better. I don't know, Shadzar can probably speak up on that. But, yeah, uh, well, they were definitely saying things that were reportable, we'll say that. Well, and on top of that, they were, it was multiple, uh, the same person using multiple accounts, almost yeah. certainly, so. 
On a positive note, we did have some new people who talked quite a bit about Gloomhaven, so that was cool. Yeah. So starting the game, um, we did start off with uh, a reading from the book of retired characters. Uh, I spent a lot of time reading from the book of retired characters because we had to catch up. But after that, we uh, did the whole Gloomhaven thing. We did some shopping. Uh, finally, Kat used the enchant enhancement rules. So that was cool. So we finally did that. Uh, we all stopped at the Temple of the Great Oak and got a blessing. But what I did realize is we totally forgot to do a city encounter, which I don't know how we missed that. But that's fine, because that's optional. It's not like we broke a rule. And while it makes up for the fact we did a whole bunch of city adventures when we shouldn't have when we were doing random dungeons. So the actual scenario we played was number 31. Uh, this is the next step on what we've been calling the artifact side quest with the big demon guy we pissed off and stole stuff from. Uh, this was our second try after failing badly once. Uh, Though since then, we've gotten Tori and Kat a ton of XP through playing all those random dungeons. So we were pretty confident that we, we'd be okay at this. So we tried at the normal level. And for us, this was our first time playing at level four. And I got to say, that might have been a bad choice. Yeah, everyone wants to play at normal difficulty in every game. You know, if you're playing a video game, you don't want to go down to easy. I, you don't want to be, you know, oh, I'm wimping out, taking the easy way out. Uh, but I think we're at a point now where it's just not realistic that the squad is going to succeed regularly at whatever the game is considered the normal level. Yeah, uh, I, I think they may have named their uh, their difficulties incorrectly because... <laughs> Uh, I don't even know. I look at other people and they play on hard every match. So I don't know. Maybe we're just terrible at the game. Could be. I can't even use the excuse that it was four players because without Tori there, we had three players, which is part of why we tried normal. Is we're like, well, we're not on four player. But yeah, normal is definitely hard. And it showed. Uh, it did not go well. We, we got really badly bogged down the first room. Um, the second room where the plan was run through as quick as possible. We actually were doing really well, and we wiped out a bunch of the monsters, these mouth creatures, really quickly. And so we decided, well, there's so few left, let's finish them off. And I think that was our downfall. Uh, we spent way too much time clearing the room, and we didn't have enough time left to achieve our goal in the third room. And by time left, I mean cards left, because that's what Gloomhaven's all about. Lovely lasted longer than last time. Like, we did better, but we barely did any damage to the MacGuffin at the end, and we came up way short of winning. Now, at the end of the stream, something new I've been doing with all our streams is I started talking to everyone about what we thought went wrong. And um, I say our first step towards failure was that first room. Like, we just spent way too long there. But I don't think that was on us. I really think that was more luck of the draw. I didn't see much we could have done better, except maybe having another damage dealer there. Uh, now, the second room, that was on us. We were doing so well at the beginning of that second room. Like we were plowing through these creatures that were like, oh, man, we got distracted. We're like, let's finish them off. We should have really rushed ahead. Yeah, I think this discussion at the end is a great addition. Uh, my only concern is how maybe we won't be getting too many people actually sitting through all two and a half, three hours well, of the yes. video to see the end of it. But hopefully people will skip, uh, maybe skip out, skip ahead and end if they if they know it's there. Because it's a, it's a nice little discussion about uh, what happened and uh, good to hear from these actual plays. I wonder if that's something we can do on YouTube to make it a little more accessible. Like if you just want the after the thing discussion, click here right at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, we can uh, certainly that, timestamp. Yeah, well, not even just a timestamp. I, I know we're in Rod, like Rado's videos. He always has that. He plays the first turn of the game. And then he's like, if you want to play, see the, the next three turns, click here. If you want to jump to my final thoughts, click here. Now, maybe that's because he has a subscriber or whatever, so he can insert links in the middle of a video. Yeah. I don't know. But it'd be something nice to be able to do. So that's the other thing uh, Deanna did mention. I think we were rusty. Man, we messed up a lot of rules. Uh, and I don't think that I, I don't even know on whose favor there were so many rules messed up there. So, yeah, for anyone watching that stream, feel free to comment where we messed up. We're aware of most of them. But we probably missed some. So because we failed again, uh, we get to do the triple threat. We get to return to scenario 31, uh, though this time we're going to make sure we do a town encounter. And I, as Sean's mentioned a few times that people online seem to like stun potions. Maybe we should pick up a couple of those. So remember, you can join the group Fridays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Will the third time be the charm? Or go for the hat trick of failures, the Canadian shame. 
So this week, I'd like to welcome you all to something new. A new segment here where we're going to step into the elevator. I'm going to swipe my bellhop badge and we're going to step out onto the 13th floor. Welcome to the 13th floor where it's currently 2007 when a rat is cooking ratatouille in the theaters. Harry Potter has its last movie. China's toy industry is full of lead. <laughs> Beyonce is irreplaceable. Riri has her be umbrella and the plain white tees are singing about Delilah. Now, we've said many times in the show, we aren't really about the new hotness. And Sean once joked a couple episodes ago that, yes, we are. It's just the new hotness from 2011. Well, today, I am all about the new hotness in 2007. That was the tile laying game Alhambra for me. Now, actually, Alhambra came out in 2003, but it was still new to the bellhop in 2007. Yes, that was my new hotness. So this past week for Throwback Thursday, I resurrected a review of Alhambra I originally wrote back in 2007 on my old Windsor Gaming Resource blog. Now, the main reason for bringing this one back is because I've been trying to introduce Sean here to some of the great games that came out when he was away from the table gaming, tabletop gaming scene. He missed a lot of these modern classics when they were new, or at least new to me. Yeah, well, I've always loved gaming in various forms. I just didn't have anyone around me gaming to uh, jump in with at the time. Now, as usual, I'm not going to read the full review here. You can read that for yourself over at tabletopbellhop.com. What I will say is that in 2007, I was blown away by Alhambra. Uh, back then, I was in this period of being constantly surprised by wave after wave of new Euro games. Around that time, I played my first ever game of El Grande. Still to this day, one of the best area controls out there. I played Through the Desert a game with the camels that looked like candy. I had just played Thurn and Taxis the week before, and I had recently picked up Hacienda from the Harry Tarantula in Toronto, uh, the one that used to actually be downtown, not the north one. This is a game that has gone on to become one of Deanna's favorites, one she's actually considering bringing to Queen City Conquest. Now, what blew me away the most back then was that all of these games, looking at two of them as a whole, how different they all are. Like every single one of these were one of these funky new Euro games, but they have almost no mechanics in common. Each of them are all very unique games, and that blew my mind. It was amazing when we'd been used to so little in the way of hobby games at all. I mean, there was a lot of mass market, even some stra some stranger and more out of the way mass market games, but still mass market games, uh, let yeah. alone this kind of crazy tile laying and card based and, and you know strangeness. Now, jumping back to the present. The last time Sean was down here, we played a three-player game of Alhambra. And I got to say, I still really dig this game. I had just as much fun playing that last play as I remember having back when I first played the game. Now, Sean, it was your first time playing. What would you think of this classic? Yeah, I, I was struggling a bit with uh, how some of the borders worked. But uh, other than that, it was a great game and not all that dissimilar to a lot of the other games I've been picking up and learning on BG. Uh, uh, board game arena as well so it uh, it sort of fit right into that that groove that i've been i've been going into and and as i've been rediscovering a lot of these again, old classics what's funny about that that original review in 2007 there's a section i did it good bad and ugly and the ugly section is all about scoring the walls and how it's hard to explain and people mess it up so uh, yeah it's good to see in a way that the 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 game has uh the bumps are still there as well yeah. as the good aspects <laughs> of the game the one thing that amused me from the original review is, that it made me laugh was that I bitched about the box size a lot in that review. And that hasn't changed either. I still hate that box. Like, it's just a dumb, it doesn't fit on the shelves very well. But there's good news for anyone who wants to pick up the game in 2019. You'll be happy to know it now comes in a standard square size box. Yep. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Now, I've only got one game this week, but it's a big one. That's Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Now, I got into Twilight Imperium with the third edition of the game uh, that was released by Fantasy Flight back in 2005. 
Now, TI3 and every edition before it is a long, epic game that is not easy to teach. Uh, due to that, it almost never hits the table. Now, despite that, there was one period in 2017 where we played a bunch of games in a row. We just happened to find the perfect mix of gamers who had Saturday nights free. So for four Saturdays in a row, we played Twilight Imperium up to, oh, man, how many players did we get up to? It was crazy. I think we got up to eight players at one point, eight or 12. Uh, those nights are very fond memories of mine because at that point, everyone knew the game and it actually became much more strategic, tactical, fun and quicker. Like we were at the point where we could finish a six player game in under five hours. And for those in the know, less than an hour a player is pretty good for Twilight Imperium. Then Eclipse was released. Now, this is a game that scratched the same itch as Twilight Imperium, but played in less than half the time. Now, Eclipse also added more Euro game elements, which I really enjoyed. After getting Eclipse, I think I played my copy of Twilight Imperium two more times, and that's it. Now, at this point, it has been over nine years since I got use out of my copy, which means it did, wasn't in 2017. That was a typo. It is supposed to have been 2010. Sorry, in 2010, we played a bunch of games at once. I even looked it up on Board Game Geek. I just <laughs> typoed in my show notes. My bad. So anyway, Eclipse came out. Did stop playing Twilight Imperium, and literally, it's it had been nine years since I've gotten any use of my copy. I haven't played since 2010 at this point. Despite that, I was still tempted to pick up the new fourth edition when it was announced. Now, this, I think, was in 2017. I think I put my dates in the wrong spot. Uh, but I made my saving throw because I never actually played Twilight Imperium 3. Like, it had been nine years. And while Twilight Imperium 4 promises to be quicker and streamlined, it's still going to be a long, involved game that probably wouldn't get played that often. So fast forward to the last event at the CG Realm. Local gamer Chad, who I've only met in the last year or so, was playing Teo to walk in with me. And he mentions that he's like, oh, Mo, I finally picked up Twilight Imperium 4. And I'm like, really? I thought you were trying to avoid it. He's like, well, I made a deal with my group. They have to play it at least once a year for the next five years, and then I'll buy it. And they agreed to it. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I said, you know, if you really want to play TI4, like, I'll set up a night at my place anytime. We can play on a Saturday. I'll send an invite to local gamers and and we can play. He's like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah. So we set up a game night. Yeah. And this is actually a great deal and something to, to make with gamers and something that works well for big games like this. Uh, another one, Gloomhaven would be another one where this could be yeah. a, a great concept where it might be fun to have a massive 4X game and learn it. If you don't have people that can will play it, this is a big chunk of money in space to uh, take up. So our plan was to play a full six player game and we set that up for Saturday. And unfortunately, this past weekend was super busy here in Windsor. Uh, there was this craft beer thing going on. The Rib Fest was down at the river. Art in the Park uh, was going on. And I personally had one of my kids to be dropped off and picked up out of camp. Uh, we started off with the players, but the day before the game, we were down to four players. And then the night of the game, uh, we lost one more due to a work emergency before one of the games. So what was meant to be an epic six player experience turned into a three player battle among the stars. Now, this three player game went down on Saturday and over on the blog, I went into a lot more detail about this play than I plan on going to here. I, we just don't have the time for it. We spent a lot of time talking about con stuff, but I want to highlight some of the changes that really stuck out to me from the last edition and let you know my overall thoughts in the game. So the first thing I noticed when Chad opened the box was the improvements to the presentation. Everything just looks better. The ships are made of better plastic. The sculpts are a little cleaner. There are new ship types. Uh, the player boards are way better organized with way more information on them, information you need uh, while playing. Uh, for example, like all the different ship abilities are on there instead of cards. Uh, the art's just cleaner. Uh, just as an example, the hex tiles, the planets are a little bigger. Uh, there is a box insert, which, oh my God, that's shocking for Fantasy Flight games because Fantasy Flight does not do box art at all. It just overall, like in, in every possible aspect, it was just presented better. And I have to say, you know, you look at this game and you think of, you know, this is this long, drawn out 4X game. And, you know, it's going to be maybe a little on the plain side. You think a lot of the, some of the the war, the more war type games where it's, you know, oh, look, green ground and gray hills. And this is a bright, 
well colored game it's very very great contrast uh and i think they've uh, they've identified things with color very well uh so definitely a shout out to that to making a you know a boring space game that could be black and white into <laughs> yep. a, a really nice looking game yeah it's it's looks good i was immediately shocked by it now the game itself is still a race to 10 points or 14 if you're crazy the basic game is 10 points and each round still starts with selecting one of eight strategies which is that same mechanic you see in puerto rico where you select roles or the the action phases race for the galaxy uh every single one of the eight has been changed since the last edition they've all been tweaked uh, the command token system is still there. That's a weird thing where you move things on your ship. That's the same. But the actual actions you do have been streamlined and simplified almost ridiculously. They basically changed a command point action to a tactical action, they called it. And it just has you put a command token on a hex, and then you do stuff with that X. Whereas in previous editions, you had movements, and you had attacks, and you had developments, and you had building. This is just you put your token down and do stuff at that spot. Whether that's move units there, fight a combat, produce new units in the hex, not move them out. It's all, everything goes to the hex. I think that's something they probably got from um, some of their other games that have come out since Twilight Imperium. And then the important thing is once there's a counter of yours in that hex, you can't do anything with it for the rest of the round. Now, or anything that's in there. So if you have ships in there and there's a counter, you can't move them out either. So that, that was a, a much more streamlined version of the command token system. Technologies, everyone still has their own deck of technology cards, but they're not unique per race. Instead, you have two new technology cards that are unique to your race. Uh, there's no more tech tree because I almost wish I had a picture of this for those of you watching on the stream to see the tech tree from TI3 because it was something else. Now, instead, each tech card just has a bunch of symbols on the side showing prerequisites, and they're just icons in color. So you'd pull up a tech and it'll show two green icons. Well, that means you have to have two green techs already in play. If it showed a yellow and two green icons, you need one yellow tech in play and two green techs. It didn't matter what those techs were. So there wasn't the whole, I need to have this to have this to have that. So I thought that was way simpler. That's nice. And another bonus was the board. So the board shows all your ships. Well, all the technological improvements for your tech. Uh, you actually put on it. So the cards fit on your player board. So if you upgrade your fighters, you put the tech card on your board. In the old game, your stats for your ships were on your player board just as like an Excel sheet. And the tech had to be on the side and you had to remember to modify the Excel sheet from the card. So this is way better. You throw it right on top. Uh, it also showed what could be upgraded on your ships at a glance. So that was nice. Uh, combat seemed to be basically the same. Uh, there were more ship types. So one of the nice changes, they added a flagship and the flagships make the game more asymmetric, like way more asymmetric. That was a surprise for us because I didn't notice until about halfway through the game that all of a sudden, whoa, Chad's ships could carry 12, um, 12 ground units, whereas mine couldn't carry any. So the humans, that's what they do. They do ground combat. So, you know, you've got a lot to think about in a game when you don't notice that your your opponents are capable of and doing completely different things yeah. than you are. Yeah, like besides, like there were two player abilities on the boards and we read those out to each other, but like we totally missed that our ships had different stats. Now, another big change I noticed was all about negotiations and trading and actual player interactions. Um for one thing, trading resources. Now players generate commodities, they're called, during the trade action. It's one of the actions you take. And they're like face down showing how many in different races is something else that was asymmetric. We didn't notice right at the start of the game because I only generated two and the other two races generated four. What these are for is you can trade those with the other players at any time. And when you trade them, you flip them and now they're trade goods. So you turn your commodities, which are useless, no one can use them, into trade goods by making deals with other players, which is really cool because now they're mechanizing player interactions and negotiations. So it's not just an empty promise of, well, don't attack me, and if you don't attack me, um, I'll do this for you later, right? Like you have an actual physical thing. The other thing is they added these negotiation cards. I don't know exactly what they're called. These can also be included in deals. So everyone had a set of four cards that were the same. And then every race had their own unique card. Like my one was called war funding. So I can make a deal and say, hey, if you don't attack me, I'm going to give you war funding to attack Chad. This actually happened in the game. I'm like, Justin, we're next to each other. I'll tell you what, I'm going to fund your war versus Chad if you don't attack me. And I gave him my war funding card. And it was really neat because now he had this card that anytime he fought Chad, he could reroll his dice and it cost me two trade goods. 
But then he had to give the card back to me. So I thought it was really neat that they mechanized negotiating. Plus, it also speeds the game up because now there's definite things you can negotiate over as opposed to having two players debate for an hour over whether it's a good deal or not that they don't attack Mechatol Rex. Now, another change, at least based on my memory of the previous edition, I don't, maybe I'm remembering this one wrong. This is the one I'm not positive on, is the agenda phase. So this is the voting phase. Now, one of the things I know is different is you don't even vote at the beginning of the game. It doesn't come into play until someone takes over Mechatol Rex, which is the big center planet in the center of the board. Until you do that, you just skip the agenda phase. Now, when you do, you now vote on two agendas each round. I don't remember that. I swear it was only one before. Now, the actual vo- uh, the actual mechanics of voting appear to have remained the same, where each planet generates a certain number of votes. But I really liked that the voting was not part of the game at the beginning. That gave you time to expand and build up your bases before you had to worry about the rules changing. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's uh, D mentions how it's really interesting how they've codified the negotiations and uh, uh, doesn't allow any more takebacks. Now, one negative thing I noticed during our play was the action cards. I don't know what they're called. They're the they're cards you draw at the beginning of every round. Um, they seemed very, very powerful. Uh, it seemed very easy to get a handful of cards. They're like you could get up to seven cards at once. And they let you do all kinds of things, things that seemed rather overpowered. Getting ships for free, uh, retreating without any consequences, uh, instantly destroying an enemy unit just by a play of a card. Uh, the other thing we found is once the agenda phase came up, we unlocked some voting cards that seemed a bit crazy. Uh, we had one card where if we voted in favor of one player, they lost all but one of the ships in their entire fleet. Which, of course, when that vote came up, we voted in favor of that. And yes, it had to do with him being around wormholes. And I guess if you knew that card was in the deck, you shouldn't be around wormholes. But man, that felt swingy. Now, it, that, that seems really game shifting. But I'm wondering, I mean, this game is stated to be best at six players. And I'm wondering yeah. if if you had that full player count, if there would be more potential for alliances and negotiations that would minimize that power of the vote because you'd have voting blocks rather than is everyone's going to gang up on Chad because, you know, it works against him and we all want to win. Yeah, no, it's, it's highly possible. I again, we play three player. The game is supposed to be best at six. So I everything I'm talking about tonight has to do with the three player game. Now, the other major change I noticed, of course, was in game length. Um, Now, one of the changes is mechanically the game can't go on forever. That is something that technically could you could play forever if no one got enough victory points. And no matter what, it was going to be long. So at the start of the game, 10 public objectives are laid out face down. Two are flipped over at the start of the game. But each round, a new one's flipped. Once you get to the sixth objective, they are worth more points. So one of the things is it ramps up. So you're scoring one point for public jape to up to two, and I guess it can even go to three. But no matter how many points players have earned, once that last tile, last one flips, the game's over. So at most, you are playing, I think it's eight rounds. It works out, too, if you're playing a 10-point game. It was interesting. When you announced the end of game on Twitter, uh, it was quite a few hours before I think anyone had expected your game to end based on all the discussions we'd had about, you know, Oh, staying up all night. And yeah, yep. this is going to go till six o'clock in the morning. And I don't think at the time, the, uh, a lot of us on Twitter were aware that it had dropped down to a three player. We we knew you 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 had it planned on four and we're hoping for six. Yeah, but we didn't know that it had dropped all the way down to three. Yeah, because it was only three player like we were done in three and a half hours which as far as I can tell is ridiculous for Twilight Imperium at any player count. Um, Part of it was I had a ridiculous runaway lead. Uh, I think because I played Twilight Imperium 3 quite a bit, one of the problems with the game overall, I don't, sorry, it's not a problem. One of the things that is part of the game is people get distracted. You were playing a 4X game and they're worried about exploring and they're worried about getting that planet and they're worried about building their fleet or they're worried about developing a technology. None of that matters unless there is a victory, a public objective up to get that thing. So if you're not, you don't have your eyes on the prize, you're going to lose Twilight Imperium. This is true of every edition of the game. I had a laser focus on that. Those first two public objectives that went up, 
I went, okay, I need to have three planets. I have a tech specialty. I looked at my board and I went, I can grab that. It's right next to, and those two are two away. How can I get those as quick as possible? Well, to be able to move two, I need to develop carrier tech to give my ships more speed. So the first round, my strategy I'm going to take is technology to develop bigger ships. My first move is going to be move into that planet. And by turn two, I can take that second objective. And then I looked at the next one. And the next one was have two ship upgrades. Well, I'm already upgrading my carriers for the first step, so now I just have to update your second step. And I was laser focused on that. I didn't worry about building up a fleet. At the beginning of the game, I had almost no ships. I didn't worry about landing at every planet near me. I just worried about landing on the three planets that gave me victory points. And that's a problem with a well, problem or feature of every edition of Twilight Imperium. And because of that, I jumped to a quick five points by the third turn. And it's only a game to 10 points. So by the third turn, I, I was halfway through winning the game. So that did impact our playtime. And both Chad and Justin, who played with me, noted they wouldn't let you get, a, like, I wouldn't let someone get away with that next time. Right. Yeah, no, and that's, and to be honest, to be fair, that is actually how you tend to play games. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you are, you are very end game goal oriented. Whereas I freely admit, and one of the reasons why I never, never claimed to be a great gamer is I just sort of enjoy playing the game and like, so the seven wonders we were talking before the stream started yeah. about the seven wonders we're playing right now i'm looking at my cards and and playing what i think i want to do and that generally doesn't work out too well for me because i'm not looking at everyone else and planning you know playing the longer game <laughs> squirrel there we go um yes. <laughs> yeah no i you know and, and i i tend to spend time enjoying the game uh which for some people is winning but for me tends to be just sort of playing it and uh yeah i i'm could probably work a little harder on my uh, aiming for the end goal. <laughs> yeah, like I said before, I, I don't care who wins, but I always play to win. Yeah. So, and like I said, it's so easy to get distracted because there's so many things you can do. Yeah. Right. You could do trade goods. You could focus on negotiations. You could focus on trying to get the center planet. The only reason I grabbed the center planet is because I know it's the imperial thing gave you a point every turn you own the center planet. Right. <laughs> that was definitely it. So overall, uh, my thoughts so far. So first off, realize. That I haven't played Twilight Imperium since in nine years. So maybe some of the stuff I mentioned that changes aren't. Uh, I'm sure fans of the game already realize that and do realize this was our first play, which means we played extreme somehow. Now, I know we noticed some ways we played extreme, but we definitely played extreme. Um, one of the things I've since learned is after you do the agenda phase, all your planets flip back over and you get to use them again. So that was something we played wrong. So it was the first place we played extreme and we only played three player, which is not the optimum for this game. Right off the bat, I got to say it's better looking, better produced version of third edition. Like that's I mentioned it earlier, it's true of every aspect of the game from the box to the insert to the artwork on the planet tiles. Everything just looks better. The most important thing, though, is it still felt like Twilight Imperium. The basic flow and feel of the game remains unchanged. You're still starting each round selecting strategies, and then you're going to go around the table using strategies and spending command tokens to do stuff. That is still Twilight Imperium since the beginning. Now, we managed to finish our game way too quick. Um, it seemed to me also that the objectives seemed easier to accomplish than some of the ones in the older game. Like, that really ramped things up. Those public objectives were fairly easy to get. Uh, the new technology system definitely also helped speed up the game. I just overall was shocked by how quick it was. Uh, but it does seem the claim that Twilight Imperium 4 is quicker than 3 is definitely valid. Yeah, and uh, faster by a large factor, it would seem, which although does go against what uh, the Board Game Geek estimated times would say. So, interesting. Yeah, usually usually they, they're saying more than an hour per player. Like, we had an hour per player, plus the teach, right? So, right. we weren't totally out of left field, but man, that game's supposed to be longer. Now, the one thing I did not like about this new edition is it felt like the randomness of the game seems to be of and have stepped up a notch. It's been increased. Uh, the fact that one agenda card wiped out Chad's complete fleet is a good indication of this. Um, uh, also, the fact that at one point I drew two different secret objectives, which are more than the public victory points that I just qualified for instantly. Like I didn't have to work. I just drew it and went, oh, yeah, I've got two planets next to an anomaly. Done. Score that point. Oh, yeah, I've already got that built. Done. I built all my PDSs. Uh, 
And then Justin had a card that he had from the beginning of the game that only gave him points if he blew up a War Sun, which is something no one can afford to build until about halfway through the game. So here's one objective that instantly, boom, points, boom, points, and Justin, like, hell no, that's never going to happen. So that seemed a little little odd to me that it just uh, the randomness seemed higher. And I don't think that's a good thing. I want randomness in my games as I, uh, not as much in my 4X expo, uh, sci-fi games. Now, speaking of 4Xs, that was my other problem. Everyone calls this a 4X game. I want someone out there to tell me where the exploration is in this game, because I there was none. All the tiles are face up at the beginning of the game. The tech decks are all the same. It's all open information. And unless you call getting random agenda cards uh, exploration, which I don't, uh, there was none. Now, in Twilight Imperium 3, uh, with one of the things right in the core game called Distant Suns, you put a token on every world. And when you land on the world, you flip it over and stuff happens. It'd be like, oh, you found a resource-rich world. Or, oh, there's technology here. Or, oh, there's rebel forces on that planet. There's exploration. That makes it a 4X game. This is not a 4X game. This is a 3X game. So it seems interesting that such a massive and well-known example of a 4X game would eliminate all oh. A whole X. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting because I'm reading the, the flavor text on Board Game Geek. And and let me tell me if this doesn't sound like an exploration game. Player, uh, you know, a strategically constructed using 51 galaxy tiles that feature everything from lush new planets and supernovas to asteroid fields and gravity rifts. Players are dealt a hand of these tiles and take turns creating the galaxy okay. around Mechatol Rex, the capital planet seated in the center of the board. So maybe the random setup, though it still wouldn't be, ex it's, it's, again, it's the tile lane before the game starts. Yeah. The galaxy is yours to both craft and dominate. Yeah, see that, that the, pro like, yeah, okay, you, you, you kind of, if, if the players know where they're starting and are given a hand of tiles to put out, there's a bit, that's still not exploration. That's, that's setting your own stage. If the tiles were face down and you flipped them over the first time you went to something, Eclipse is a 4X game. Eclipse, right. you don't know what's out on the board until, except for where you start. You can explore different ways. But overall, I, I got to say, I dug it. It was still fun. Uh, it may not have been the epic game night that I was expecting, which was probably good because I had to drive to Point Peely in the morning anyway. Um, it's not quite as fun as I remember third edition being with nine, ten players, but I think it was just that... Uh, it was a player count, right? I, I think that was the biggest problem is just three players. It just how you get an epic experience with only three players. I don't think it was the rule changes from this edition, the last edition to this one that made me feel less, uh, less enthralled with the game. Uh, what I want to do now, though, is I really want to play a six player game. Like I want to play a full six player game, hopefully with Chad and Justin, who already know the rules and just see how this if this game really can shine. And if that randomness is going to be a factor, because if it affects everyone about equally through a whole game, maybe it's not a problem. But if, if I see people getting screwed over by a bad card draw again, I may stick to my original copy. So quick jump over to the pile of shame. No change. It wasn't my copy of Twilight Imperium, so I don't get to knock that off the pile. That's Chad's pile of shame. Goes down by one this week. Uh. So that's what I played this week. Sean, unfortunately, hasn't gotten a lot of gaming in. I feel bad for his work being as busy as it has. Uh, any gaming looking forward to next week? Going to have some time to get anything in? Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to keep up with the six plus games I have going on at BGA <laughs> every day uh, with uh, generally three to four games of uh, Jaipur with uh, Eric every day. <laughs> The Jai, you're going to be the Jaipur master. You're gonna oh, I wish I'm he's Jaipur kicked, tournaments. He's killing me. So unless unless I'm I, I got to try playing someone else. He's, he's he's like, go find someone else to play with to see if you're any good or not, because he's kicking <laughs> my butt every time. Uh, <laughs> wow. That's kind uh, of funny. Yeah. Uh, so this week, Saturday is game night at the CG realm. Uh, they're doing demos of a game called legendary forest, which I have to say, I've never even heard of. So I'm going to have to look that one up. I might uh, get a chance to try that. I am really looking forward to playing more tail to walk in. I really enjoyed that. Uh, slight spoiler. We did play Monday, so we'll be talking about that next week. And I read the rules for Gentis yesterday, but wow. Um, I need to watch a video for that one because it fully explained what all the actions were, but I couldn't figure out why I would want to do any of them. Like it, it explained all the mechanics without explaining the theme or something. Not, not the best rule book I've ever read. 
It's interesting. Um, looking at legendary forests, and it looks like a sort of a polyomino and combined with meeple-ish uh, cube cube placement. It's a pretty game. Yeah. It's it's very uh, very very nice look to it. Uh, it looks interesting. Plus, it, it's more in Ian's wheelhouse. The tale to walk, and I think hurt him a little bit, though he did right. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, correction. Sorry, not next week. Next week we are. Um, you're gonna get to hear Sean yeah. and I talk about Board Game Geek. So in next two week weeks, we're live. <laughs> so hell, yeah! In two weeks, you're probably gonna get my origin recap. I know recap episodes don't always do the best, and they're not our most popular. But if I'm going to a con, I want to talk about everything I played. So it's probably gonna be an origins recap. It's gonna be a tabletop gaming weekly for the entire episode. So we're nearing the end of the show. Anything interesting going on in the chat before we check out for the night? Uh, I know D is checking uh, in to see if it really is just a six player game. And yes, apparently yes, uh, is. four is six player maximum. Yep. Uh, we the were... old one played more. You could either play eight or 12 or something. It got ridiculous. Which is weird because it three, it, it's listed on BGA is still three to six. But no, I'm saying Twilight oh. Imperium one. The one, uh, okay. third, three. So the third edition of Twilight Imperium. Yeah, third, third says three to six still. Which no, there great. was uh, the Shattered Empires or something. Expansion? expansion? Ah, okay. There you go. I think it was called Shattered Empires. There there were multiple expansions. Right. I'm expecting expansions. So one of the things Chad found, uh, this was probably going to be in the actual, but I'll mention it now, is he found a cardboard-based fan-made version of the Distant Suns rules for 4th edition. So you would put cards down on all the planets, adding back in the X. But like, still, it blows me away that everyone talks about this being the biggest 4X game ever. And I, I literally, I can't find any exploration. Well, ever. and uh, Shadzar says, so it's a triple X game. Well, maybe that's why they added the 4X in. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's it. That's something a little different. Yep. There's a few of those out there. We don't tend to cover them on this show. Nope. They, they, go, they go in the pile with the, uh, the poop and the pimple popping games. Yes. I will be talking about one that gets close to that. Well, and now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. P.S. Goujon. Thanks. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. 8, 8 p.m.? 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Is it? As they start, as they talk about games and game mastering. No, it's eight p.m. It's always eight p.m. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. It's always eight p.m. Okay. This right mark records eight p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Uh, Roger Malush, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts doing this, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers on YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.